Hello, class. Let's see here. Get to my right class here. All right, MJC 101. So we've just covered uh, the war for independence or uh, a revolution, uh, according to a, uh, a popular um, uh, dialogue, right? Or debate. So I have Jane. And now we get into that um, less popularly known um, time period uh, during the War for Independence in the early 1780s uh, to 1787, in which we, um, we lived under the Articles of Confederation. So technically, right, we're in our second government here in the US. And I'll be honest, um, one thing that, um, that I find a little frustrating uh, um, is the fact that almost every topic, almost every chronological era, et cetera, that they put the United States history into uh, is laden with debate, uh, lots of disagreement, uh, different interpretations. Uh, and, and of course, for various reasons, as I've already uh, explained, I love that. I find that to be healthy. Uh, so let's see here. Let me make sure I have nine of you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. So I have all nine of you. Um, but uh, I think that is a healthy thing. But now, um, with with the topic of the of the um, of the Articles of Confederation, it gets a little taxing because there seems to be so much consensus. And like I said, I, I don't interpret that as a good thing. Uh, but you almost get a, a, a mono-causal uh, uh, narrative of why the, uh, the Confederation failed, okay? Uh, why it only lasted uh, from the early 1780s to 1787. And so I, I just went with it. And I, uh, like I said, I thought, well, they should be familiar with it, I guess, if they're, if they're going to major in U.S. history. Uh, but I really wish I had read something more refreshing, something revisionist to it. Um, and I apologize for not yet having done that. And so that interpretation, right, that you will find on number one uh, in this week's assignment is, uh, is, is one of excess, right? That um, the, during the War for Independence, you had 38 newspapers. Uh, I can't remember how many magazines, uh, uh, hundreds of clubs uh, that were percolating and things as, as, as um, unofficial as taverns or bars. Uh, and, and of course, the uh, assemblymen who had, been, uh, who had taken their stand against the British government and now were meeting in secret. Uh, so everything from legal to extra legal uh, at different levels of, 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 of socioeconomic status uh, and demographic, uh, Americans showed signs of, of adhering to uh, the beliefs that Bernard Balin has in his book. The enlightenment, social contract, popular sovereignty, natural rights of all human beings, right? Um, the, uh, uh, the notion of checks and balances, uh, libertarianism, right? That uh, in people inherently uh, cannot handle power. That there's something sown in human nature whereby they will inevitably uh, become insatiable, and they will want more and more and more of that power. So it is of necessity uh, to limit uh, what those in power can do from the get-go, right? And have them heavily accountable. Uh, to the people. Uh, even though you don't have classical liberalism yet until the early 1800s, you, you had some precursors to it and people saying that there is a collective wisdom from the people, that, um, that it's better to err on the side of the masses, of the majority, 
than it is to err on the side of um, a few people. And Thomas Jefferson, he tinkered with that notion in his debates and his correspondence with John Adams, right? Uh, whereby he agreed and said, I do agree that the majority very often, he said, especially in our generation, because a lot of them uh, uh, are not educated. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was huge on education, right? Um, he said, especially because many of them are not formally educated, they will often, I concede to you, John Adams, they will often make the wrong decision. But he said that, that those poor decisions made by the majority will oftentimes be less pernicious. They'll be less dangerous, less harmful uh, in their consequences than the malevolent uh, scheming, designing decisions by the educated select few who know exactly what they're doing and still proceed to do that which is dangerous and wrong and uh, harmful to the majority of citizens, uh, et cetera, right? So hence, it's better to err on the side of democracy, right? Remember, demos means the, the people in Greek. So democracy means rule by the common people. So at any rate, you find evidence during the war for independence of state after state or colony prior to that, right? Uh, forming uh, new um, uh, constitutions that were more in line with those beliefs that were percolating at that time. Uh, you know, and of course, some people cynically call it propaganda, uh, but whatever you want to call it, or rhetoric or propaganda at that time, that it's not a coincidence that you find uh, a growing number of, Amer of, of American states that began adhering to those, um, those beliefs. So for instance, right? Uh, Pennsylvania decided to go without a governor. Uh, they decided, right, that um, uh, with the, the Scottish libertarian rhetoric that was going on at that time, right, that uh, you are to be fearful of, of any governing administrator, right? And uh, you think of, right, administrative authority, legislative authority. Uh, no problem, Joanna. I caught you. I caught your name popping in and, and have you down. Thank you. No problem. I'm glad you're here. Um, so at any rate, um, uh, they, they said in particular, right, that a, a governor uh, at the state level is basically a king uh, writ small, right, just at a smaller, more micro level, that that governor is the king of his colony, etc. Uh, the same functions of carrying out the law, of carrying out justice and police forces, and those types of executive powers that the governor enjoys, he could abuse just as easily as could a king. Uh, and so hence, uh, Pennsylvania went without a governor and uh, a few states uh, really uh, circumscribed, right? They really put limits around what their governor could and could not do. So that if, when you look at the majority of states that were declaring their independence and, and, and declaring their own new state governments from having been a colony under Great Britain, right? You find that their, their chief executive of their, of their state uh, became less powerful, and of course, deliberately so, right? Uh, you also find um, uh, the, uh, uh, the franchise, right? They call it enfranchisement. Uh, those, who are who, those who are um, declared to be citizens, right? Because remember, they were called subjects under England, and now we're, we're declaring them citizens at this time. Those who are declared to be citizens, it, it broadened. In virtually every state, in virtually every state, right? Uh, and matter of fact, in um, is it New York and New Jersey, they momentarily gave enfranchisement or citizenship to women, and we'll get into that later. Uh, they ended up taking it back. Um, I'm laughing how how crazy that is. Okay, not I'm not making light of that, but um, you have um, you had limited opportunities for manumitted or and or freed African Americans to enjoy some citizenship rights uh, in a handful of states, uh, in up to about five states up in the northern uh, states. Not to mention uh, one northern state after another uh, began, I, be, I believe beginning with, um, oh gosh, it wasn't Delaware, but it was a small northern state. But at any rate, one northern state after another uh, began um, 
uh, emancipating their slaves. Uh, several of them issued gradual emancipation laws, whereby slaves up to a certain age um, had to work up for a certain number of years before they could be freed, or that slaves born after a certain year uh, were automatically free, and everyone else born before that unfortunately had to live out their lives as slaves, uh, and even trying to compensate them at market value uh, for their investment. So it wasn't just an outright unconditional emancipation for slaves up in the north, and it wasn't every northern state, uh, but several northern states, <clears throat> as you can see in the textbook, uh, freed their slaves. And some, like I said, even gave limited citizenship rights to African Americans, all right? And of course, only in the north, and that's a whole other can of worms that we'll get into when we get into the Civil War. But at any rate, um, you look at the power of the lower or elected house, right? Uh, because remember Montesquieu had written that you are to have checks and balances and that the popular masses, that they will feel beholden to the majority of their constituents who voted them in. And they'll feel as if, you know, kind of in quid pro quo fashion, they owe their voters and that they'll just cater to whatever selfish motives, selfish desires uh, their voters have. And so hence too much democracy is possible, right? And so um, if anything, several of the states erred on that side of being too democratic. Uh, one or two states went without an upper house and had a unicameral, uh, just one house, property elected legislator that would write the laws, right? Um, uh, other states uh, made uh, what we're somewhat familiar with now, right, is that um, the, the upper house and lower house had to collaborate and both pass by major simple majority uh, legislation, uh, but giving certain veto powers, uh, certain uh, powers to, um, to initiate legislation uh, to the lower houses above the upper houses. And when I say upper houses, I mean those uh, who were handpicked by governors or by state legislators, et cetera, who were not um, popularly elected. Uh, with Once again, with Montesquieu, that sense of balance, right? And so if anything, you can make the argument that in several of the states, the lower popularly elected house was more powerful than the upper unelected house, okay? And so um, when you look at your classical writers, right, uh, because Remember, uh, those who have become founding fathers arguably were not a mini example. They were not a microcosm of their population. The population, a 10th of 1% got to go to college. I mean, no kidding, right? But amongst the founding fathers, about half of them or over half of them uh, had gone to college. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the largest demographic as far as you know, occupation uh, amongst the founding fathers just in a few years in 1787 uh, would be a lawyer, right? And needless to say, you know, with a majority of them being lawyers, uh, lawyers were a tiny fragment of the American population. So they were, they saw themselves, uh, you know, uh, arguably uh, as the cream of the crop, if you will, right? And so going back to this with the states and so forth, right, is, um, the those who were educated had read um, in in our you know beginnings of Ivy League schools, Princeton, Harvard, etc. Right, uh, William and Mary, uh, they had read their Aristotle and their Plato, and and those Greek writers right were very cynical about democracy. They had written that um, the majority of people are not by nature nor by nurture are not fit to rule, that the majority of people are creatures of habit. They are, um, they follow their, um, their, their, their blind selfish impulses, right? Uh, the Greeks called it their appetite. Uh, I think of later like Freud uh, who called it the, the id, right? The ID, uh, a child, right? Uh, you can go into a restaurant and a little toddler might reach up and grab food from the plate of a stranger because it looks alluring and he or she wants to just take a bite, right? Um, following the id, 
can be a very dangerous thing and its consequences, right? Just simply seeing something, wanting it and going for it. And so they made, they kind of infantilized the common people. Uh, you know, Aristotle and Plato were arguably, you know, by today's egalitarian notions, were pretty snobbish uh, about the common person and contending that the common person uh, did not have the self-restraint and the virtue uh, to rule well. And then not to mention intelligence, right? Uh, remember Aristotle had written the notion of natural slaves, that some people were created by God, he thought, uh, with strong, able bodies, but weak minds. And hence, God and nature had rendered them fit to be slaves and nothing better than that. And so they had read uh, writings like this, right? They had read about uh, Pericles, right, uh, P-E-R-I-C-L-E-S, uh, as governor of Athens uh, during the heyday of Athenian or Greek democracy. And they, ruled, they saw how tumultuous uh, things became in Athens, how uh, people, you know, kind of, um, they, they easily, um, they, they went after their id. Uh, they wanted land reform. They coveted land from the wealthy and desired it and wanted it at, at any expense, passed legislation to find ways to get it. And, um, and con obviously negative consequences accrued from that. They had popular prejudices against outsiders and others, and they would turn their wrath on scapegoats oftentimes democratically. And, and uh, so different... Uh, historians and, and intellectuals in Western civilization that were read by our founding fathers, right, in these universities uh, were very cynical, uh, very critical of democracy, not only in theory, but in practice, right, saying it just didn't seem to work very well. Um, you look at a democratic time when the, the, the popular tribunes uh, elected bodies of Rome uh, and look up the Gracchus brothers, G-R-A-C-C-H-U-S and others, right? They kind of were rabble-rousing demagogues, arguably, at times. And they led people astray. They led people toward their selfish motives, toward their hatred of another class of Romans. And it led to a lot of struggle and strife. So at any rate, um, the Founding Fathers had read this, right? And of course, the conservative ones like John Adams, who basically had, you know, different times said that the masses are asses. Um, he read this stuff and, um, and they would argue and say, uh, see, what? Oh God, I'll be right there just a sec. And so they would say, um, see, uh, democracy is excessive uh, in, 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 its, in its own direction. And the masses of people need to be checked uh, by a, uh, an educated, more self-controlled, a more dispassionate uh, group of people and body in their government, right? And so um, when you look at the Articles of Confederation, you find evidence similar to this, right? So for instance, in several colonies, um, you had a lot of pressure uh, by the constituents in these new more democratic states uh, for land. And they pushed and pushed those who they, who they elected and were held accountable to them uh, by way of election uh, to give them more land. But in doing so, it started uh, territorial disputes, uh, Maryland and Virginia, Pennsylvania and, and Virginia uh, almost went to war with one another uh, over territory, right? Uh, you had, of course, class disputes um, with already the beginning of, 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 of the rights to squatters, those who squat on uninhabited, uncultivated land it might be uninhabited presently, it might be uncultivated presently, but it doesn't mean that it was not owned and claimed by an absentee landowner. And so he would take them to court and oftentimes the property elected uh, representatives and even the judges uh, would side with the squatter, not because they felt it was inherently right uh, for a poor ambitious man to take land that may not have been absolutely necessary from a wealthier man uh, on principle, uh, but because they were worried about getting voted back into office and they wanted and needed the vote of that person. So they began pandering and catering to their voters, right? And so um, 
Voters also uh, did similarly uh, put pressure for credit, right? Because remember, arguably, the main avenue to the American dream was by way of, um, it was entrepreneurial. It was by way of starting a business of some sort. And the most popular business was cash crop farming, uh, farming a single crop and selling it for profit, right? And so, um, so at any rate, they, um, they, um, in doing so, uh, they put pressure to, uh, to have the availability of bankers or lenders or creditors, right? But what happened is, of course, you have what has always happened. You have the vagaries of weather, uh, droughts, uh, uh, just for various reasons with the, the, the weather, uh, uh, crops not coming through. Uh, you have uh, changing circumstances with markets and, and, and supply and demand that changed the values of, of how much you could get for your given crop at a given market. So because of all these risks that you're taking, I mean, right, entrepreneur literally means risk taker uh, as a business owner. When they would incur these risks and suffer for them, right, they oftentimes would default on paying back their loans. So the creditors, bankers, right, uh, the lenders, they would say, hey, we can't survive out of the goodness of our heart. We're not lending money out of altruistic kindness. Uh, we're lending money to make money, right? That's our, it's our reason for existence uh, as a business. And so um, what would happen is the, the majority of people who would become indebted to the creditors, right? Uh, chasing after their American dream would pass laws like stay laws, buying themselves uh, another two years often uh, to pay back those loans. Well, needless to say, that's going to hurt the business of the creditors, who are going to have a difficult time staying afloat, right? And uh, and trying to survive, you know, up to two extra years uh, to get their money back. And so eventually, uh, the creditors began making ultimatums uh, to the leaders of the states, saying, "If you pass another stay law, you pass another law." I mean, because in, in some extreme cases, they actually pass laws. Um, contending that, that basically the equivalent of modern bankruptcy, that they could, they could ba basically claim bankruptcy and, uh, and not be penalized for it, right? But the creditors and lenders, they gave ultimatums to the state assemblymen and said, hey, we'll literally take our tents and leave this state and we will not lend money to another inhabitant here uh, if, if we don't start getting our money back. So eventually, like in Massachusetts, uh, the state, even the poverty elected states who gave stay, stay law after stay law to the debtors, uh, catering to them for their votes, they, they gave in, they capitulated eventually and said, you know what, enough is enough. You have until a certain date to pay back your loans or else, right? And under English common law, which we had not abandoned, but just uh, adapted, just changed, right? Um, under English common law, you could still at that time go to debtor's jail. Uh, in, in, in uh, failing to pay back your loan. And so at any rate, like in Massachusetts, right? Uh, the, um, the judges uh, go over to a certain, uh, about, about two, two or three counties, right? That were just rife, just filled uh, with poor debtor farmers who uh, lost their crops and never paid back their, uh, their creditors, right? So they set up camp in the local townhouse meetings, uh, buildings, and they began um, uh, summoning one farmer after another to come to court and give him an ultimatum saying, okay, you have until this date or we are going to confiscate your farm and possibly even send you to debtor's jail, right? And so when this happened, there's a guy named Daniel Shays and he had been a minute man, right? Uh, those who claimed that they were ready at a minute's notice in this, their state militias uh, to fight for the war for independence. He literally put on his minute man, his you know, continental army um, uh, uniform and uh, with, by force of arms comes into the courthouse and threatens to shoot and kill the judges, right? And then they come and they use their sheer force of numbers and their weaponry and they intimidate the local jailers and they forcefully take out of jail uh, those debtors who had already been convicted and put into the local debtors jail, right? 
And so claiming that they were following this same war for independence tradition, the rights of the people to pursue the American dream, the right against, uh, you know, these uh, authorities to, um, to arbitrarily take property from the people and throw them into jail for financial reasons, etc. But needless to say, to many conservative and moderate Americans, they thought that that was, um, that was stretching the truth that that was abusing the American political tradition of the, of the war for independence, right? Where they said, hey, wait a minute, your right was inherent in electing your own representatives. Your right was inherently practiced in gaining the right legislatively uh, to get the access to credit or loans and to start your own farm, uh, cash crop farm and business. Your right was practiced uh, in, 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 in arguably, um, you know, abused when you pass state laws to give yourself more time to pay back your lenders. And now you have clearly crossed the line and used your strength in numbers and used your sheer, sheer uh, threat of force or violence, right, uh, to subvert the rule of law. That, that, that is the rule of law that you have until a certain time to pay back your loans and then you could have your property or your collateral uh, confiscated and even go to debtor's jail. Uh, for a brief period of time. So to a lot of Americans, right, this began to look excessive. It began to look, um, you know, dangerously um, uh, anarchistic, right? Like it just, it just uh, like with sheer anarchy uh, uh, and perhaps, you know, the tyranny of the people, of the common people. And John Adams had always said that, right? Uh, he had always written and spoke that that the majority of people are just as apt and able to become tyrants over the rest as one person or a few people can, right? And, um, and of course, that's what Aristotle had written. Uh, Aristotle had written that, you know, uh, tyranny from one person uh, is just that, a tyranny. Tyranny from a group of a few people, uh, he called an oligarchy, right? And tyranny by the majority, yes, he called a democracy, uh, right? He called uh, proper rule by the majority a polity, P-O-L-I-T-Y. Uh, so at any rate, uh, you know, the conservatives, right? They could look at this practice and abuse of democracy and they could tell their libertarian, more liberal um, compatriots who are of their same educated class See, you should have known better. We told you so. You read your Aristotle. This is what he warned about democracy. You read about uh, Pericles uh, of Athens and the Gracchus brothers of Rome and saw what democracy can do and its true manifestation. And you should have known better. And events played right into the hands of the conservatives so that they could say just that to the liberals and say, see, I told you so. So eventually, says this popular narrative, enough liberals, enough libertarians at that time who feared bigger government, right, and wanted to err on the side of too much democracy, enough of them either became silent and just did not enter the, pu the public uh, fray, the, the public battle over this issue, like most famously Thomas Jefferson, who literally left the country and went to France, right, um, or actually even uh, grudgingly, almost silently, switched sides and agreed that something needs to be done with this Articles of Confederation, that it is, quote, too democratic, all right? And then not only too democratic, but too decentralized. Because remember, according to libertarian rhetoric, right, government is a necessary evil. It is never to be trusted, that inherently people will abuse power if given to them, right? And so hence, what you're looking for as government, as a natural necessary evil, is just that. You're looking for the base minimum of what is needed and not one drop more. So to the libertarians, right? Government don't tread on me, distrustful of government. To them, right? The idea was to keep government as small and localized as possible. And for at least two popular reasons, right? For one, uh, the obvious one, 
is that uh, when government is smaller and what is when it is localized, the those governing are more accountable. Uh, people literally know where they live and they live in closer proximity to their rulers. And um, and uh, and a smaller, more localized government, your bureaucracy, right? Those who work directly for you from day to day and run government is going to be smaller in number. And it's going to be, again, more locally located close to those that you are ruling and governing. And, um, and so you're going to have fewer resources at a smaller local level. And then also, right, is that they're, they're less inclined when they're localized and small, that supposedly politicians are less inclined and less tempted to get out of touch with their constituents, right? And so contrast that today, right? The, the libertarians during the Confederation uh, arguably would look at the government today and have a lot of uh, misgivings or apprehension about it. First of all, right, a, uh, a representative from Modesto, right? You have a, a representative for every 30,000 civilians, uh, states the constitution. So uh, the representative, right, uh, in, in your local area of Modesto, California, and your 30,000 person district uh, is throughout much of the year in Washington, DC, and basically in Baltimore, Maryland, on the other side of the country, right? And uh, to the libertarians, that's scary. They don't want that. Uh, they, they want their governing authorities right there, in, uh, where that they know from day to day what the people are going through, what it's like, and what the conditions are like in their. Um, you know, uh, district. And again, like I said, that they will feel likely more accountable if they stay here in Modesto and know that the people in some cases literally know where they live, right? And it gives them more of a sense of accountability to their constituents. So at any rate, the, the Articles of Confederation, in a confederation, every state is almost autonomous. It's almost independent. Uh, so, for instance, under the Articles of Confederation, if your state, if your locality said no to a tax, the tax was not collected in that area. And we're not familiar with that today, right? If, 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 if a tax is collected by the majority of, of House reps and senators, it doesn't matter if our 30,000 man uh, you know, uh, district said yes or no to that tax it's gonna get collected in our district as well as the others, right? They call that coercive tax powers, right? That Congress now has. Um, are you okay, son? At, at any rate, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm here with my son uh, as my wife works uh, outside the house. Uh, so at any rate, um, going back to this with the Confederacy, right? Is that, um, your your uh, local representative could say yes or no to taxes and to legislation. And, um, and of course, in your district, it didn't matter with general legislation, but it did matter with your state uh, if, if it was to be um, you know, represented by your state. It took oftentimes a super majority, more than just uh, seven out of 13, right? But it took a super majority, at least nine out of the 13 states uh, to pass uh, certain pivotal um, issues uh, in, in Congress. And so they deliberately made legislation uh, difficult, uh, difficult to pass because they wanted uh, things to be almost unanimously decided upon and agreed upon uh, before they had to be adhered to uh, at the state, okay, at the state and local level. So at any rate, um, you know, going to this, right? The Confederacy was meant to be very, um, uh, very um, inefficient because to them, right, efficient, you know, and arguably to the libertarian argument, you look at, you know, Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany, it was very efficient. They got a lot of legislation passed in a very quick fashion. And of course, in hindsight, that's not a good thing. That's not something to boast about. So the Confederacy was meant to be very, um, very inefficient uh, because it, its main uh, concern, underlying concern, arguably, was to prevent tyranny, right? Was to prevent tyranny by the few, 
by by the 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 um the centralized leaders of the confederacy so they wanted to keep things deliberately localized democratic right and more accountable to the people and so when you look at the scandinavian countries at the uh, italian city states during the renaissance era and you look at these confederacies historically again the founding fathers were educated and they had read their history. And you find that in many cases, confederacies have been a little bit chaotic, right? Whereby uh, different states have tended uh, to, to vie and compete with one another instead of cooperate, uh, to have uh, friction and even competition uh, between one state and another, right? So that, that um, you know, that, that could definitely be a concern about having a deliberately decentralized government, like a confederacy, when the states have so much autonomy or independence from one another. And what do you know? When you look at the Articles of Confederation, those same types of phenomena seem to happen. Again, like I already mentioned, Maryland and Virginia, et cetera, uh, Pennsylvania uh, almost went to war with one another. Uh, New Jersey and New York had uh, something commonly known as the commercial war. Uh, whereby they would tax the heck out of products from e each other's uh, state. And then they, it just became more and more punitive and vindictive until it became ridiculous economically. Um, and so you see evidence of them vying with one another. Uh, you find uh, very little uh, collaboration, right? Uh, when they had rebellions during the Articles of Confederation, right? So you have leaders like Pontiac, Little Turtle, and other Native Americans who, uh, who began uprisings uh, against um, the, the Confederate government. And especially when they're in areas like the Ohio Valley that was just con uh, considered at that time just a general territory and they had not carved out states yet from that area you know, the given states said, well, that's not our problem. Uh, that's not our issue. It's not happening down here in Maryland. And so we're not going to send, we're not going to vote to send any of our boys of our state militia to go fight and die up in Ohio against Native Americans when it's not our problem and our business. And so all the negative historical and philosophical concerns about having a decentralized confederacy, right, which had been read by the founding fathers seemed to materialize during this time period. So again, the conservatives could read it and tell the libertarian liberals, see, I told you so, you should have known better from what you had read. And so that arguably when they met in Philadelphia, they met in Maryland first and then in Philadelphia, and they decided to scrap the Confederacy and devise a less democratic, and more centralized republic that we have today, right? That even enough of the liberals uh, agreed to either stay silent or even switch sentiment and, and, and uh, support uh, this, this change of government, okay? So sorry, that was very wordy, but on number one, I just give you that popular narrative, nothing refreshing, no revolutionary thesis by any part. Uh, it's just the standard narrative that I know I got uh, as, a, as a young kid uh, decades ago. And okay, and so that supposedly we tried a more democratic, a more decentralized and libertarian, uh, freedom loving and democratic government than we have today. And that the people abused that, that liberty. And they played right into the hands of the conservatives of uh, behaving in the same historical way, uh, negative way, right, harmful way that uh, caused concern even from the liberals and thought, you know what, maybe things are actually too uh, excessively decentralized and democratic. Okay, so any questions on number one? You guys still with me? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. So when you put at um, number one, 
you put according to historian Robert Middlecoff that part. So uh -huh. I was wondering. So when you're talking about um, in your in the argumentative assignment part one about middle when about Middlecoff, what do you, uh -huh. according to the Robert Middle and the Western state of political representatives voice their acknowledgement. Is that what you've been talking about? Yes. Yes. So that was my that was my source was Middlecoff, uh, his book. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, you would be hard pressed to find um, a real revisionist, different, refreshing, challenging thesis to this very standard, uh, almost universal thesis. So I just happened to choose Middlecoff as my source, but I, I could have chosen uh, several uh, with the same thesis. But yeah, that which okay. we've been talking about, that's Middlecoff's thesis. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, anybody else? All right, so um, moving on to number two, okay? When you look at number two, you find clear evidence as you guys are going to do next week, right? With the with the Constitution, uh, you could arguably, when you compare the Confederacy, right, to our republic that we have today, our constitutional federal republic, and looking through the original Constitution and the first ten amendments, you can make the argument, which is often made, that we took a conservative turn that the latter is more conservative, right, uh, than the former. And so you look at um, uh, Article 1, Section 8, right? Article 1, Section 8 gives powers to Congress that uh, over the states. You won't find that in the Confederacy, in the Articles of Confederation, right? So they clearly were giving more central power uh, to this centralized Congress uh, under Article 1, Section 8 than had previously been exercised by Congress, okay? And anyway, I, I don't want to get too much into it because we're going to get into that next week with the Constitution. But you could definitely find conservative clauses, you know, supporting slavery, et cetera, found in the Constitution, right? <clears throat> so you could definitely make the argument that, okay, it seems as if the Founding Fathers' agenda was conservative. They wanted to conserve more of English political tradition from the past, right? Um, as opposed to these, you know, novelties, uh, these new elements of the Confederation that they, that they went back from in the summer of 1787 when they wrote the Constitution. So you're already, uh, you know, historians are already in that direction, right? But they do concede that there were some enlightened notions to the Constitution. So for one, right, checks and balances. Uh, Congress has certain powers. Uh, the president has certain powers. And the judiciary has certain powers, right, uh, separate from and independent from one another and over one another. Um, the House of uh, Representatives has certain powers and rights as opposed to the Senate right, that works along with them. And so you definitely have notions of checks and balances, for instance, and that was an enlightened concept. Remember Montesquieu in his book, Spirit of the Laws, wrote about how the best way to prevent tyranny is to give different uh, bodies, different government bodies, and different demographics and factions of, of, of the country, uh, certain, um, you know, um, corrective and competitive powers over and along with one another so that no single group prevails over any of the others. You also clearly have the Bill of Rights, right? The First Amendment, the right to uh, the freedom of expression, the freedom of religion, the freedom of the press, right? The Second Amendment with the freedom to, uh, to bear arms, right? Which was a Scottish libertarian uh, belief. Um, you also clearly have about three or four amendments that apply to due process, uh, your right as a citizen who has been, um, um, has been suspected 
uh, and indicted for a crime. So all the rights that you have to defend your rights and your own innocence are found there, right, um, in the Constitution. And so when you look at those enlightened item, uh, items, right, uh, that you find in the Constitution, some people like Pauline Meyer, that I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing on number two, say that, well, the, the conservative founding fathers, they don't even deserve credit for those enlightened components that you do find in the Constitution that we switch to, right? That they, they don't deserve that credit, that they had pressure applied to them uh, to concede those enlightened or liberal, when I mean liberal, I mean just the old school liberal of focus upon individual rights uh, components to it, right? That if they had been left to their own devices, they probably would not have done so. But had it not been for pressure from below, from the common people. So for instance, right, the Constitutional Convention, those who wrote the Constitution of Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 had been elected in the past. So it's not as if they were just a self-appointed group. They had been elected under the Articles of Confederation by their, their proper states, but they took it upon themselves uh, as having been elected in the past under their confederacy to scrap that confederacy and write one, a new one, a, a, a new government, right? And then in so doing, you have evidence from Madison and some of those who kept minutes at the Constitutional Convention that some of them wanted to uh, basically approve it themselves, to go back to their proper states and have those same elected representatives, who many of whom went to the Constitutional Convention, right? Have them go back to their proper states and uh, approve or ratify this new government, right? Embodied in this new written constitution. But to some people, right? That's like proofreading your own paper. How do you have the very same people who wrote the constitution approve it, right? So when they came back, you look at states like Massachusetts, like Pennsylvania, and these other states, right? And you find a, a, um, a public quarrel, a, a public conflict, a fight, a battle, right? On behalf of those who were not present at those conventions, basically saying, right? Oh, heck no, you are not going to just ratify your own document. You are going to give it to the people. You are going to have, you're going to be held accountable to the people and let them become aware or apprised of what is written in that constitution. And they are to approve or not approve it, right? Um, on principle of what we fought for in the war for independence in the, in the quote revolution. So for instance, in Massachusetts, they tried to come back right, according to Pauline Meyer in her book uh, called Ratification, they tried to come back and have the same group of individuals who had been elected in the past uh, ratify or approve it. Well, according to her book, right, literally several dozen representatives showed up uh, who, had, who were not invited, who were not directly a part of the Articles of Confederation, but were extra legally outside of the Articles of Confederation government, right, uh, informally, if you will, elected by their own village and city constituents who said, we're going to elect, oftentimes it was two people, we're going to elect two people, they're going to go to this ratification convention, and they're going to make demands on those who are there, who are running that convention. So sure enough, right, Little towns, Braintree, where uh, John Adams was from, Ipswich, these tiny little towns and villages of Massachusetts, uh, dozens of them, uh, sent elected reps to the convention. And they come, right? And again, they came with virtually, according to Pauline Meyer, uh, ultimatums saying, hey, the people of my, of Ipswich, or whatever this, this given town that I represent, right? State that we are not okay with this constitution unless something is spoken, something is explicitly given in there 
about such and such or about this or about that, right? And they began making ultimatums. Pauline Meyer says, it's not a coincidence when you look at the specific demands made by these uninvited but popularly elected representatives who came to the ratification conventions that, what do you know, you find a large proportion of their demands added to the constitution that you find those what the, what they demanded were was not originally written in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia but when uh, the nine nine states ratified it right a couple years later by 1789 that they were now found in there and of course Pauline Meyer says you do the math the founding fathers did not initially intend to put those enlightened ideals in the constitution, but they were pressured by their own constituents, by the people of their own states saying, right, we will not approve of this. You do not have our approval unless you put in the following. So very often, she says, almost most often, you found something connected to due process, whereby a lot of people, right, were concerned about, uh, in particular, the English political, um, yes, you, you may, Rudeep, thank you for asking, uh, whereby you have a, um, uh, no problem, you have a, um, a tradition whereby uh, if you are, uh, you know, uh, if you are uh, indicted for a common law, right, that the, uh, the English authorities could come and pilfer into your things, uh, they can uh, not allow you to represent yourself. Uh, all kinds of abuses that we would consider by today's standards under the English political tradition, right? Uh, for those who are suspected of having committed a crime, we clearly, our people clearly wanted something better, something more liberal, something more democratic on behalf of, the, of, of those, um, you know, who are being tried for having committed a crime. So basically, uh, what what Pauline Meyer is stating, right, is that we would not have arguably the most enlightened component to our constitution or one of them, and that is the Bill of Rights, uh, those natural rights uh, codified into law that are guaranteed to individual citizens, that we would not have that Bill of Rights if the founding fathers were left to their own devices but they were pressured enough. They received enough ultimatums from the people in these ratification conventions that they gr almost grudgingly added the Bill of Rights to the Constitution, okay? So it's fascinating. If you just look up the ratification of the Constitution and you look at state by state, uh, the political fighting that occurred, uh, the power struggles, that occurred, uh, the additions and, uh, and changes that occurred uh, during the ratification process. It's fascinating. And so when you read Pauline Meyer, right, on the one hand, you're, you're uh, I think it's revisionist of the founding fathers. You're, you find yourself sometimes a little disappointed in the founding fathers, that they did not initially wanna put certain components into the constitution that they didn't seem very enthusiastic about putting such components into it. But you find yourself feeling, uh, you know, a vicarious uh, patriotic sense of pride about the common people of that generation, right? How they would not stand by and allow a government that they didn't feel uh, empowered, amp amply empowered the common person in the states, et cetera, right? and they made their demands and made their stand. And that when you look at the final product, the final you know, constitution as ratified, that they, they at least partially won that battle and having those components added to it. Okay, so that's number two. That's, that's um, the thesis arguably of the book called Ratification by Pauline Meyer. Anybody have any questions on that? Um, anything else, you guys, before we conclude? Because uh, notice that those are the only two numbers for this assignment. 
So go ahead and just choose one, and, but please read both uh, for test number two. But uh, anything else that I need to be um, aware of, et cetera, before we leave? So I noticed that last week on the um, like argumentative assignment papers, each number had next to it what number on the test or what question on the test the answer was found in that section. Yes. Um, are they all going to have that until the test or just the first one? Um, you know what? I shoot. I don't know. I mean, did I include that in this one? No. Okay. Yeah. I apologize. So um, I tell you what, I can make a note for myself uh, to, to, um, to kind of re-implement that. Cause I did it first and I thought, well, I don't know, just in case I change the test, the numbers may not be pertinent. Uh, maybe it's not necessary to do that. But but hearing this from you, um, I'm, I'm hearing that maybe that is something that is desirable for you guys that you might like me to do. Yes, please. Okay, sure. Thank so you. I'll make a note of that, okay? Um, I'm writing that down right now. Uh, because I'm, I'm happy to re-implement that. And remember also what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to put up a study guide as well. Okay. I'll put up a study guide for you guys to see uh, weeks ahead of time so that you could see what exactly what number uh, will entail what topic, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. I'm sorry. I should have done that on my own. No worries. I, yeah, I'm I happy to do that. Question. Yes. So, so it's not 100% relating to the argumentative assignment, but it's just kind of a little question about, so basically um, when the, the, um, the 13 colonies were part of the British and the, and the European, they, the Europeans had problems with pirates, but then when they broke off, did the... 13 colonies when they broke off from the British, did they have problems with pirates too, or did they have, or was it just the Europeans who had problems with that? No, from, from what I understand, and it's, it's not, to, uh, to be honest, Jaden, it, it's not my strong suit, uh, but I've, I have read a couple books on that topic. And from what I understand, we continued in some time and in some ways, and in some areas, it was even exacerbated. It was made even worse. Uh, we continue to have issues with piracy, for sure. So yeah. especially, especially during the Confederacy, and I would argue um, that especially along the, the Gulf of Mexico and into uh, Louisiana, even though we, okay. had, we, you know, we don't purchase that until 1803, uh, it, it still absolutely pertained to the colonies and to their trade down the Mississippi. And... Um, I, I have read up on that, just piracy at the bottom of the Mississippi and in the Gulf of Mexico alone uh, into uh, French or Spanish Louisiana uh, territory. Uh, it was it was continued to be um, a, a, a major issue, actually. I have a question okay. also. Thank you. No problem. Uh, yes, what's your question? Are all the like quizzes and tests open book or open note, or should we try to not look at that stuff? No, that's a great question. And I mean, for one, I have no way of enforcing that. And for two, I'm just I'm just the type of instructor that I don't sweat the small stuff. As long as you're 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 putting forth the effort, you're looking for answers, I have no problem with it being open book. So yeah, thank you for asking. That's a great question. Uh, but I, I, I really don't. I, I don't. I don't have any philosophical issue uh, with you taking the test as well as the quiz uh, open note style. All right. Thank you. No problem. Oh, I have a question. Sure. If we don't do like the assignment, like before, like some of them, like let's say the assignment is due Sunday night, if we don't do it at the time, will our grade just automatically be zero? Because like, like I'm for this like the next week I'll be like out of town and going somewhere so I'm not sure if I'll be able to complete work so I'm just asking if it like if it'll affect my grid if I don't do anything past the deadline. That's a great question. Uh, 
All right. So what what happens is it depends how and of course, I am behind right now and I'm trying to play catch up. But um, if I happen to before you do it, um, uh, get to that assignment and I see that I absolutely will put zero. OK, but if you uh, make it up, I ask you to let me know by way of a Canvas message so I know your name, the exact assignment that you made up late, so I can go back to that list of assignments and find yours, right? And I am willing to change that zero and grade it at a, um, at a, uh, a deducted, uh, reduced uh, uh, point spectrum. So oftentimes, right, I'm willing to give about 35 points if it's done well and it's done late later on. Uh, you could still earn about 35 points. And those 35 points could absolutely mean the difference of one letter grade to the next. So I, I, uh, I ask you, please, if that's the, uh, the case that particular weekend and you don't get it in, uh, please make it up uh, for your sake. Uh, make it up. Give me a Canvas message when you do so. So I know, um, uh, but yes, I do, Omar. Um, I, I prefer Canvas message, if that's okay with you guys. Uh, that's what I finally have caught up with and that's what I plan to stay on top of. Uh, that's my first mode of communication that I, um, that I plug into from day to day are the Canvas messages. So I, I would, no problem. Thank you, Omar, all right. So I hope I answered your question, uh, Josh. Yes, you did. Thank you. No problem. And um, one thing is that the last time that we had a test, you went over like some of the answers and stuff. Uh -huh. Like kind of like how like that, that um, provided kind of like a way to understand the questions a little bit. Sure. Are you going to? Are you going to still do that for the next test or is that just for that one? No, no, I plan to continue that. Okay. Yeah, I plan to continue that. One of the only changes that 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 you can anticipate, Jaden and everyone, is uh, I, I usually don't continue to allow you to do unlimited submissions to the test. It's, you know, oftentimes the second and third test, I, I ask you to just have one shot at it, one submission. But other than that, as far as you know, the question of tying section numbers to test numbers, putting up a study guide uh, during test week, having a Zoom meeting and going through the test and questions, all of that I plan to continue uh, throughout the semester. Okay, thank you. No and problem. I had a quick question. So when I was gonna Canvas message you, I don't remember what it was for, but I couldn't figure out how to do so. It will oh, take all you could. Um, do you? I see again, Caitlin. I, I sadly, I only know my side. You know, uh, my my instructor side of getting into. I I, I haven't been able to see uh, student view uh, on that. But I know with myself, I I simply hit inbox. Um, I have course uh, option right, and and of course I have a, a few different courses to choose from uh, that I teach. But like I said, uh, under under course, I have um, inbox. Do you know? Do you remember or recognize if you have an inbox option? Uh, I do have an inbox option. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, and thank you, uh, uh, Kaylee, um, Kaylee or Kylie. I'm sorry if I mess it up uh, for, for for adding that suggestion. Yeah, she says that that is the case that you could hit inbox and then go to Canvas messages. Thank right, but you. No problem. But yeah, certainly no need to apologize for that question. We want to make sure that everything's clarified for everyone. This is good, you guys. I like these questions. Uh, anybody else? Anything else? No. All right, so if, if that's it, you guys, we'll go ahead and call it a day. I have the 10 names, or we're down to nine now, but I was asked, you know, by the 11th and, and the 10th, and so I'm okay with that. 
I understand things happen. And so I have your names for extra credit and uh, I wish you guys well. And uh, by all means, like I said, especially Omar, uh, Canvas message, uh, you know, let me know. If you have any questions, concerns, anything that I should be aware of, I'll be happy to hear from you. All right. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Okay. It's nice to, to, to quasi see you guys. And I hope you guys do well. Thank all, you. All right. See you next week. Okay. Bye. See you. All right. Bye bye.